We're good? Okay. Welcome to Hoboken Talks, a weekly streaming event that highlights one of Hoboken's many interesting inhabitants and discover how they got here and what they love about Hoboken. Tonight, we're with Marty Anderson, who has been here since 1971. I would characterize him as Hoboken's busiest guy. Tonight, we'll discuss Marty's trajectory, which will include making parade floats for Macy's, Thanksgiving parade, touch upon but tread lightly upon the ups and downs of the stair business, coaching youth, youth sports, running for political office, serving on the CERT team, and now chairman of the Hoboken Preservation Commission. I'm exhausted just reading that. I'm Steve Zane. I'll be your host tonight. This event will be streamed live on Facebook, and we invite viewers to type in questions for our guest. Um, without further ado, and I always wondered exactly what ado was, let's welcome Marty Anderson. Hey, it's good to be here. Good to be Thank here. Thank you so much, Steve. That's, uh, it's a lot of intro, but uh, I guess number one, I didn't get here till 1981, so uh, I, I just want to set the record straight on that. Um, I initially came here uh, because. I, uh, I had finished college. I had done some dinner theater, actually, in Florida. I was a performer. I was a tech. I was uh, very New York City-centric, and I was living at my parents' house in Livingston. We kind of agreed that was no longer a, a good idea, given my uh, schedule, shall we say. So um, I started looking for apartments. A uh, studio in Manhattan was... 350, 375. I said I don't have that kind of money, so I started looking around Hoboken, on a suggestion of a friend, and I took a rental at Seventh and Willow, 708 Willow, uh, and I signed a one-year lease at 500 a month, and I had a roommate, so I was down to 250 a month, and I wouldn't sign a two-year lease because I wasn't going to stay in this little town for more than a year. So, uh, hi, Valerie Huffnagel is saying hi. Hi, Valerie. Hello. Big supporter. Thank you. And um, I've been here ever since. I lived at that address for till 1997. Uh, it, when I moved there, it was a rental. It went condo in, I'm going to say in 1989, somewhere around that. Uh, the developer found out that it was going to take three years to get rid of us tenants uh, who were paying well under market at that point, and um, they cut me a deal, actually. I'm not going to go too deep into it because it, it wasn't entirely legal, okay. but uh, they managed to uh, get me a mortgage somehow, you know, a little uh, war chest money for my parents, a little sweat equity of myself working on the property and improving it for the developer. and. Uh, that was it. So I had a condo there, and uh, as luck would have it, a uh, woman moved in upstairs, lovely woman. Uh, I went upstairs the day she was moving in, talked to her mother, and it was going over recycling policy in a, a rather uh, haughty manner, I might say, and it, that was the mother of my now wife since uh, 94 is when we got married. Uh, we both had condos in the same building. We were living in one. We were renting one. And eventually, uh, we, we didn't want to live by committee anymore. And my wife said, it is time to get a house. And that's what we did. So we moved to Second and Garden. And we've been there since 1997. So when we bought that house. Well, who knew that discussing recycling with the, the potential mother-in-law would lead to romance? Yeah. But there you go. <laughs> we learn every day. We learn every day. Well, that's, that's not an uncommon story. A lot of people have come to Hoboken and, and some variation of that, myself included. So I only plan to stay a year, <laughs> 45 years later. Um, so I see from looking through your pictures and reading through your bio that you are really, and I've known you a long time, but I, like a lot of people, you don't really know them in depth that way. So you, you're very involved in youth sports and you seem to know, I have thanks for the hat. Like that, but how did how did you come to that? Were you a sports guy in in college or high school? Uh, not really. I played a lot of baseball when I was younger. I was in little league. I played Babe Ruth league. By the time I got into high school, I was more into making money. I uh, started a lawn mowing business. I started a snow shoveling business. I uh, then went to work at the local stationer candy store, and I just fell away from sports because I became more interested in revenue, okay. oddly enough. But 
I didn't have the greatest Little League experience, and um, once my children reached that age, of, of course, I encouraged them to get involved in uh, baseball. It was the only sport I knew. Soccer wasn't really a thing when, when I was young, so um, they started playing Little League. I saw promotional opportunities there, and I saw uh, just a way to give back to the community, um, coach a team. Uh, you know, get my name on some hats, uh, get my name in the paper, uh, get a little buzz going on, and uh, have some fun with some kids, learn some baseball. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty much how the sports thing started. Once once I got into place, I'm just a joiner. Uh, I, I once I start doing something, okay. I very rarely stop. Uh, Bill Kern saying, Bill uh, Kern. "Love the stairs photo, Marty. You look so sharp." And uh, Steve's hat. We're, okay. We're, we're we're very up on Steve's hat. Uh, the, this background you see is a piece that we did. This is uh, actually in Weehawken, Park Avenue. That's a uh, white oak tread. It's uh, stock parts, new railing, new uh, balusters. We did this wainscoting treatment up the walls. Um, at this point, I am not the carpenter. You know, I just I just play one on TV, as they say. Okay. Um, I what I like to explain my job title as is I do everything but production. Okay. Hire, fire, uh, buy things, sell things, find the next job, finish the prior job, invoice the job. Uh, but I did start. It, it, I came up with the tools, as, right. as the saying is. Okay, well, you got to know what you're doing before you spec a job. You want to run some photos, Rand? Let's just keep going here. Um, so one of your more interesting sort of things that you've done is you, were, you worked in the parade factory, the Macy's Parade Factory, which I think people who've been in Hoboken for any length of time remember, and it was a big ritual to go up on Park Avenue when they were rolling the... the um, the floats out to get them through the Lincoln Tunnel for the, for right, the Macy's that, this, Parade. Stop there. This is the parade studio. This is uh, very shortly before it was it was torn down. This was, as is pretty well known in these circles, uh, was the Tootsie Roll factory, and there was a couple of interim businesses there, and eventually it became the Macy's Parade studio. The second floor was where the balloons were inflated and tested, and downstairs was the float making. I was a staff carpenter and welder for Macy's. I did linkages and moving figures and that sort of thing. And uh, if you go to the next photo, I think it's the next photo. This is it, just something I personally love. It, it's a crane. It's up in the head of the building you were just looking at. And it, it works on two axes. You, you get in an extension ladder. This is about 40 feet in the air. And you climb into this little basket and you have some little controls which can take you around the grid of the ceiling, which is used to do things above floats. Sometimes you have to grab something and pull it up higher, or you have to drop something down on the float or something. But it was, it was a very old factory. It had a lot of things that this would never make it through an OSHA inspection today. Obviously. So this was there when Macy's bought the building? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. I, Tootsie Roll had some function for it, which I don't know what it was. Probably dangling something over a vat of Tootsie Roll goo or whatever and th this is my sense of humor here I, it's, uh, I knew they were inflating the spider-man balloon one of their more famous balloons and so I wore my spider-man shirt and had my picture taken with it incredible so and that and so did you have to interview for that job and what was you have to tell so actually I did I was at the time I was working at a display house as we call them in Manhattan uh, space design and they're they are known for to this day doing the Christmas windows with animated figures for okay. Warden Taylor Sachs, Marshall Fields, and I was a staff carpenter there. It was the first or the second job I had in New York City. And as such, I began to develop contacts in the display industry, which had tremendous crossover to um, the Macy's Parade Studio. And plus, uh, I lived in Hoboken, and the Parade Studio was a bike ride away right. from my house instead of uh, getting on the 126, schlepping into the city and walking 15 blocks. So it was right. a tremendous upgrade in my lifestyle, paid a little more money. I, at this point, I had a resume. I was considered a good fit because uh, display welders is a somewhat rarefied trade. 
So you went from making things that move to making things whose job it is to stay steady. Right. <laughs> that's, 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 that's very well put. It's an interesting transition. That's good. Eric, Eric Cameron likes the Spider-Man shirt. Very nice with Spider-Man. Um, All right, and this is uh, why you look unhappy. Uh, that, that's this is. Where's that happening? This is a good you? morning for this me. This is a good morning. Okay. Uh, actually, that's um, I'm wearing my parade jacket, spanking new. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the big perks of working at the parade studio. Is every year you got one piece of Carhartt clothing. They said, "Do you want a jacket?" I always went for the Ike jacket. I had like right. four or five of them, but uh, you could get overalls, you could get the pants, and uh, they they gave you the patch, and you had to sew it on yourself. Cool. Oh, there's Irene. So below, cool. hi, Irene. Uh, it was an interesting place to work. I will say that. Uh, really, quite uh, so. In retrospect, it's some of the most talented people I've ever met in my life. And if uh, whatever John Cheney has been on your program, he's sculptor, excellent artist. Uh, you, you mentioned some there. Bob seems to know everyone there. Beth Lucas. Worked there. Manfred Bass, of course, the legend, uh, was running the studio when I was there. John Piper would come in seasonally. He eventually took over the studio. Uh, just in retrospect, having moved around the professional world, it was just such a tremendous meeting of minds there. People that were really creative, really well skilled, really amazing. I mean, there was one man, his name is Tom Engstrom. Uh, you may have heard of him, but. He knew welding cold. He knew, he knew everything. He knew fiberglass. He, he could wire float. He could do the armature for it. He could do the fiberglass for it. He could design the motion for it. He could do the trailer bed for it. Just amazing. I, I've just never met people like this ever since. And so when did they actually, like in a season, when did they start making the floats? The floats, they sort of made year-round. The the way it works is this. The, the Macy's Parade Studio actually, to my knowledge, or at this time at least, it, it runs at a profit, meaning that uh, when a, a customer goes into sales in their, their flagship stores in Manhattan, uh, they buy a float package for three years. And let's say that's the Daily News or Red Book or, or whatever. They will then design a float. Manfred Bass would do that at, at this point in time. And they would build this float and it would be on national television. And they would pay X amount to have that done. After three years, the float still existed, but the contract did not. Right. So that quite often that float was morphed into another product at pretty significant stand, savings from right. starting from scratch. And, you know, it was retread, literally. Mm -hmm. And uh, they moved forward like that. So there's... There was quite a bit of money to be made. And uh, you, you just hold on that for a second. I'll yeah. get into that. Um, the point is they do floats all year. The parade studio does. The, the parade is their main event. They do the 4th of July fireworks. They do armatures out on barges. They do all the support for the firework display. Mm -hmm. And they do the flower show is the other big thing. Did not do. know any of that. That's interesting. Really so all the same. Well, it's... To some extent, to keep them busy in the off season, but they are all mechanically oriented. Right. Well, a lot of welding involved, that sort of thing. This, after I went out on my own, I had a studio in. I don't, do they still call it the Monroe Center? I don't know. We used to call it Levelor back in the right. day. This is 720 Monroe, and uh, I actually was on the third floor, and I, I met with the landlord, and he said, "Well, this corner will be yours." And basically, they drywalled off a corner of the loft, which was the Level War factory, and I started making things, and this was a contract I had with Kellogg's to make a giant toaster, which had waffles come out of it, and uh, through more shameless self-promotion, I got the ear of Karen Listener, who agreed to cover this for me, and uh, she got me the cover of The Reporter. Well, that's what this is. This is 1999. I left the parade studio full-time in 1997 and worked there seasonally for about another f six years maybe it's great and it, it, there's a whole history i mean this could go on for, for for months and years of things that were made in hoboken you know from tootsie rolls to wonder bread to whatever else i mean for some reason this town has attracted these these well-known 
iconic kind of products and services. So it's it's pretty interesting. And oh, here you, Thaler here's Picard, and I I don't know if I can say that on the air, but damn. Believe me, out. <laughs> that's a swell waffle, Marty. Okay, that's, 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 right. uh, I I still have it in the uh, container on my lot. Okay, so, uh, you, you can see it anytime. Hi, Thaler. Um, Thaler is on the Historic Preservation Commission with Steve and myself, and on the museum background. board as well. So, she well, covers a lot of ground too. Covered a lot of ground. So, second busiest person, maybe the first. We'll have her on. We'll see. What other photos do we have? Oh, oh, here we go. Not well, one of your better pieces. Mo mo <laughs> moving right along. So right. I, I was out of my own. I was doing things like that toaster. I was doing sort of an event support thing. And when 9-11 came along, no one was doing public events anymore. That industry just died. I said, what can I do? I have a studio in Hoboken, da 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 I was becoming a kitchen and bathroom guy, doing an occasional display. And I lit upon stair repair because I realized every time I looked at a stair repair that they, whether I quoted it or not, they would follow up with me, follow up with me. And I was looking for a specialty and I went in the Yellow Pages and I realized there was only one other stair manufacturer in the Yellow Pages wow. in Hudson County. Wow, in the whole county. I said, yeah, okay. I said, well, that's, that sounds like an opportunity. So uh, we started, and here's what's sort of interesting about Hoboken in my business and how the two have been able to move in parallel. When I was starting out, this was a typical job. One tread failure, a tread would fail in the middle of the house. As everyone here probably knows, back in the day, any house you went to in Hoboken, they would, it had been in the family for 50 or 60 years. Right. You know, grandma lived in apartment one, and the daughter lived in apartment two, and the grandkids lived in apartment three, and it was all those kind of things. And Really, nobody had a lot of money, but they did have some broken stairs. So we'd go in, we'd fix one or two, and that became the, the cornerstone of what we're doing, which is now, over time, as a zero has been added to everything happening in Hoboken, if not several zeros, what we do now is mostly entire flight replacement. But this is how we started, an occasional one-tread job. And isn't there a rule that they, if they were to replace these stairs entirely, they would have to be bigger, they would take up more space, and, and you know, buildings in Hoboken being historically narrow, that wouldn't be a good thing. You're absolutely right. What, <clears throat> what, what you're seeing here, this, this, that's the stringer, the, the white board you're mm -hmm. seeing diagonally. Here we are leveling, we're leaving the treads in the same location on the left side. On the right side, we're hiking them up, in this case, about three inches because the building has settled. Right. Hoboken is on landfill, and uh, Buildings settle towards a stairway. There's a 10-minute version of this concept. But the fact is, they have to be righted. But if you leave the stringers there, it is considered a repair and not a, not a rehab. Right. So literally, like you see those old cartoons of the man in the bathtub being held up by the plumbing. It's the only thing left of the house. <laughs> Houses are now gut renovated, but the stairway stands up in the middle of this gutted construct because they're grandfathered in. You right. cannot make a stair basically that steep or that turns that fast and make modern code. But this is an existing condition. And I think a lot of people don't know the, I don't know if, if that's one up there or, or it's not there, but there's the the coffin turn. Oh yes, you'll see as we move through the images. Okay. I, I survey a couple of those. Um, that's oh, you can go back. That's a really nice stair. Can you tell us about that? No, the the really oak, um, like mahogany thing. Yeah, my third one grade drawing. That, oop, oop. that one. Next one. Oop. That one. Keep going. This is one we just did. That that. That one. That. Where's that one? I believe it is. I believe this is on the 1100 block of Washington. I took a picture of this because Hoboken is loaded with these things, and people right. just don't know it, and. As I was saying about the stairs just staying in a gut renovation, in these older buildings, not only is this level of craftsmanship unheard of at this point in time, you, it wouldn't matter if you had unlimited budget. You could not find people to, who could do this. Right. And back in the turn of the century, this was just very common carpentry. It was done all the time. Usually houses were built by a gang, eight to 12 people. And on that gang, the way I understand it, there was always one stair guide, which is someone who well, that's all they did. These stairs are built in place. They're not factory made per se. Right. So uh, it's 
we I just I just love these things and it's it's really the one thing that makes it a city house. If they take the stair out like that, I'm just uh, I'm always very disappointed. I'm like, why didn't you buy a house in Paramus or something right. and, and do a different thing? Uh, this is so my this is when we were first getting in the stairs. I started doing some drafting. This is a picture of me. That's our our logo. Pre friendly estimates. This is um, a job we just did. 1200 block of Park. The reason I'm showing it here is there is not one rectangle in that picture it's an wow. entire flight of what are called winders and below it is another flight of what are called winders this is my main carpenter henry amazing craftsman we're about to put what happened here actually to give you some idea what's going on in the world of craftsmanship is someone had been through here and they had ripped out the original railing and now if you look at that can you imagine what kind of railing would have been on there well, it was gone. Well, mm -hmm. it wasn't gone. It was upstairs in the corner, yeah. as if, uh, you know, getting ready for a fire or something. And the homeowner called me in and said, well, you know, our stair guy said that uh, they, they're they going to pass on the railing contract. Basically, they can't figure it out. And I said, did you save the original railing? Because the original railing is an organic shape. Right. <laughs> it's basically a, a spiral with corners. So we had to take that and put it back in. But once we went, we started looking at the stair they wanted to put it on, I had to say, if you want us to do this really, we have to do the stairs over. Because they were done very haphazardly, they weren't level, they weren't even, they had issues too technical to uh, keep your interest here. But the fact is, this is a stair, this is the third stair in this house. There was one that lasted 150 years, another one that lasted about two months, and then this one. Huh. And we subsequently did the railing. We uh, also do built-ins. This is 1200 block Jefferson. Homeowner designed it. We installed it. Nice. This is, I, I just love this because of Journal Light Construction, pretty well known in the construction industry. I'm referred to as a, a stair expert, a stair specialist here, okay. which I, I thought was some pretty good recognition because I don't think there's a lot of stair specialists out there. I mean, if there are, I can't find them. There are stair factories where they make factory stairs. There are not people that specialize in the repairing of stairs. Right. As far as I can tell, in northern New Jersey, I'm the only one. I would say that you will find specialists of all stripes in places where there's a need. So Hoboken has a zillion stairs like this right if you, if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be living in a place where you're the only guy with that that double spiral you're right. probably gonna have to fly marty in that's it <laughs> private jet marty's coming um, but it, i think that i used to be involved in historic preservation renovations and things and rehab and they would they would they would fly people in for some of these exotic things because there was just nobody gilders you know people's marble work whatever so i think you're you're in in that crowd right. i wouldn't well, be surprised one day if someone calls you from like georgetown uh well i we have something of an internet presence and i get calls from delaware there you go. canada canada <laughs> west virginia okay. you know and they say well i don't know if you come out here said, of course we don't come out to delaware right we're in Hudson County. But yes, the demand is there and the craftsmen are not. And right. uh, matter of fact, the Singleton family, if you know them from Singleton Gallman, I was called in to do one of their stairs. And I said, well, you know, this doesn't really kind of look like it's ready to go. They said, we want you to do this before you retire because we don't think anybody's going to be available there. to do this after you retire. Yeah. Yep. Which is, is flattering in a way and it, it's sad in another way. Yeah, because they think you're, you're on your way out. I mean, come on. That's not nice. This, if you've ever seen <laughs> Historic Preservation Commission, this is my background. This yes. is a stair we did in Montclair and boy, 87, a long time ago. Uh, this is a hobo, this is a typical Hoboken second floor. It, it starts with a wind, it ends with a wind. Uh, this one was done in white, very elegant. As long as you don't have muddy shoes, <laughs> children, right. you're fine here. But uh, it, it makes for a striking image. So I, I want to move into some other areas. I want to talk about your your sort of uh, public service. I mean, you are a man who 
as I said, you're, you're the busiest man I know in Hoboken, and, and with a running a business and you know run, and and sponsoring sports teams and having a family and other you know personal concerns that we all have, I see that you ran for a county position, and that um, how did that happen? Where did you? Uh, well, it's it's the Democratic Committee. Um, I was sort of minding my own business, if you will, and the uh, mayor called me up and asked me if I would run for this position, and uh, I did agree to do so. So uh, there you go. That's me were on you, the ballot. Were you, were you We're successful? Up again. Yes, I'm, I'm currently okay. holding this office and oh. I'm running for re-election now, even though the districts change. I'm in right. whatever Ward One, District Seven now. It, it used to be the Six Six. So it moves around, but uh, it's it's mostly uh, a get-out-the-vote group. Mm -hmm. Does postcard campaigns, travels to other locations, that sort of thing, to uh, further the Democratic agenda. And you're on the CERT team, the Civilian Emergency Response Team. Can you tell us about that? That's yes. It's uh, I guess it's a it's a stage below uh, paramedic or something. It's uh, the the Requirements change. When I started it, it was pretty exhaustive uh, examination you had to go through. You had to understand national defense and, and a lot of things. But the, the okay. fact is, if something like Sandy happens, this is why I did it. If something like Sandy happens, they're, you know, all, all the police, all the firefighters, all the ambulance drivers, they're all busy. They need support. And this is a group that supports those kind of things. And uh, this is me in uniform and... Uh, I guess one of the good things about being on CERT is it gets you closer to the front of the list for something like a, a okay. COVID inoculation. Nice. So that's uh, that's. Uh, <laughs> and so, what what other what other kinds of training did you have to go through for this? Uh, boy, God, I think at the time it was about ten weekends, uh, firefighting, how, how to enter a building where someone's in distress. Uh, all sorts of things that don't come to mind right now, but it, it, it's basically community defense and, okay. uh, support, and uh, quite often it comes to nothing more than you're the person they go to who knows how to operate a walkie-talkie who has to distribute flyers so everyone knows where to get water because okay. the plumbing's been turned off or something like that. Okay. I mean, I don't know of another municipality that has a, a CERT team. Uh, they're pretty common in Jersey now. Are they? Okay. It's a, it's a national thing. This is my youngest son. Or I have two sons. This is my youngest one. His name is Henry. He's uh, in college now. He's a uh, sophomore, rising to junior. He's a soccer player. This is his promotional shot from uh, the website. He currently attends uh, East Stroudsburg. Nice. This is my older son. This is him graduating from the Macaulay Honors Program at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, they give you some kind of special sash here, which we're uh, displaying, and this is uh, the person who saved my life, my lovely wife who moved in upstairs, and happily her mother didn't know how to recycle, so uh, uh, the, re the rest is history, as they say. I think there's a lot of guys who are going to use that. They're going to go in and say, do you know how to recycle? Because let me tell you. This is our mascot, Daisy, in a promotional shot. Uh, is is wonder Daisy, wonderful Daisy still with us? Yes, it okay. is. Okay. Our third mascot, if you want to be that way. Okay. Uh, but uh, wonderful dog. Australian Shepherd miniature. Nice. A great disposition. What does she chase or herd? Uh, everyone around. Okay. Basically. It's a very intelligent dog. Very hard to figure out what she's on about. Likes to have breakfast at about 4 o'clock in the morning, so that's when we start our day. Okay. And, uh, Rules the roost. Yeah. That's well, good. The way it works. This is me just standing in the back. Uh, the soccer team I sponsor, also called the Hammers, uh, won the championship this year. This is a uh, you know, glamour shot of the team. Excellent. And, uh, here's our trophies from the last two years on the mantle of my house. And this is the Hammer shirt. This is my baseball team, which I started sponsoring 12 years ago. And uh, I'm phasing out of managing the team. I managed it for a good number of years. And as I like to put it, I'm trying to become the Steinbrenner of the team who uh, has a lot of authority but really doesn't do anything except tell other people what to do. And uh, this is our hat, which uh, Mr. Zane has been 
kind enough to display. This is the year we won the championship, and uh, since uh, I was something of friends with the photographer, they made these wonderful images up for me, which I, I thank them for. But. And so, uh, how how far afield, like I've had nieces and nephews that have played, like they go to other states, you know, is, is this on that level, or is this a... Local? No, no, this is Municipal League. Okay. It's... Uh, when you win a championship, it, it's a citywide championship. There is only one Little League okay. in Hoboken, okay. but it, it's on a national charter with Little League. But right. no, they don't play beyond that level. That's basically what you're talking about is travel and all-star right. baseball. All this is thing. this is it ends about the same time school does. Oh, here we are with the coffin corners now. This one I found was interesting because I assume there's some narcotics involved in this uh, <laughs> design concept, but uh, for, for those not from uh, the old house culture, a, a coffin corner supposedly is in the corner of a stairway where it turns, or the wind as we call it in the business, and the idea is that the corner of the coffin can go into it and rotate so the coffin doesn't have to be upended in order to get it down from upstairs. This is back, of course, when people were shown or viewed in, in states or what have you uh, in their own home. This is something I thought was interesting. You, you have a lot going on here if you're in, into the history of Hoboken or Victorian row houses in general. At the bottom, you're going to see the boilerplate linoleum with metal edge on top of the wooden stairs. Right. Uh, the coffin corner, but in this case, we have the Virgin Mary that's been displayed there and she's behind glass, and when I was there, I looked at her pretty closely. I'm pretty sure this was a good 60 years old oh, yeah. when, when I got there. And they've respected it. And this goes back to what I was saying before. These buildings in Hoboken, before the last 20 years, they just stayed in the family forever, forever, and family members came and went, and occasionally there'd be a tenant, but it was usually the family broken into different familial units occupying a three or four family building, and right. this is that type of building. It's a great shot. Here's something I, I wanted to mention because I thought it would be of interest in a historical museum. You will find these in lobbies of buildings throughout downtown Jersey City. You see them in Hoboken to some extent, and the way this story comes to me is these were made by people from Western Europe, basically, uh, or Flemish people or Dutch people or whatever, and they would, these were just painted right on the wall right. in the lobby, and supposedly this was done for, to cover your board for a week or something like that, but these are just, whatever you would call them, frescoes, and some people have painted around them over the years, but chances are that artwork is 120 years old and exists to this day and there's quite a few of them around yeah i once i had to photograph city hall for the aia or something and there were three giant safes and they all had paintings in them and one of them two of them pertained to hoboken but one of them was just sort of an idyllic scene it was in the water department so it was just this like running stream with you know a, a young woman in her you know sort of bonnet walking by and th that's i got the same thing these were just sort of generic itinerant painters that would come through and, and right, do these right. for decorative and, purposes. Right. And in this case, you can see they, they only have the slightest grasp of perspective. Right. But uh, God bless them. So in taking this, you have been on the HPC for how many years? 2014, I guess, nine. Nine years, okay. And what drew you to that? I was doing a lot of work on stairs, as we surveyed earlier, and I became, I became affiliated with the Hoboken Green Team, basically because the kind of construction I do is considered green, as opposed to ripping out a staircase, we rehab it. So that I'm a, always was a green guy, and uh, this sort of fell in with that naturally, mm -hmm. and I started moving in those circles, and I guess there became an awareness of me in town, and... Uh, uh, Paul Somerville, you may know, said I, I might be a good fit for this, as did Nancy Cricco, and um, I believe it was, at the time, it was Jen Giatino who really supported me in getting appointed to the uh, Historic Preservation Board. And so what do you think of what's going on now? I mean, now you're the chairman, you've been on, I mean, we've been on together, I've been on for seven and a half years, so we've known each other for 
fair amount of time on the commission, but what what do you see happening? Where do you want it to go? What would you what are your hopes oh, and dreams? Okay. Hopes and dreams? Um I, I, I'll I'll say this. I, I, Hoboken's at a crossroads now. It's uh, everything's speeding up. As I was saying earlier, uh, a zero is being added to budgets, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people that have been displaced from Manhattan for just plain space reasons, let alone budgetary reasons, who are now coming to Hoboken, and they don't want to live in an old Victorian building. They want to tear that building down and put a brand new building in the same location. And if no one stands in their way, that is just going to continue to happen and accelerate until there is little to nothing left. And uh, this, this so park, uh, this is Garden Street, Garden. the 300 block of Garden. This is this photographs are no more than two months old. They they just took a building down, and uh, it's you can attest, Steve. Uh, when they want to demolish a building, in, in many cases, and there's a very long backstory to this, but the fact is some of them come before the uh, Preservation Commission, particularly if they're in the historic district, right. and uh, sometimes we can save them and sometimes we can't. And uh, basically it has to be weighed the relative merits of saving that building versus what might replace it versus its significance to the town and um, I don't know there, there's there's just more and more of this happening as the money increases in Hoboken the fact is if you have a 1500 square foot house on a lot and zoning will allow you to build a 3000 square foot house on that lot that's what you want to do if you can afford it and right. uh, that's what people are doing this is on uh my block or around the corner from me, this is the old Manos um, vegetable market, I believe. Right, absolutely. And, yeah. uh, and, and just about every one of these pictures I take, there's someone sort of giving me a dirty look. Right, they think you're gonna, <laughs> think you're gonna give them a ticket. This was an interesting building for years and an interesting store. I remember going in there and he had ginger. I mean, this guy sold wholesale. The, the retail thing was just because he could make some money standing there while he wasn't delivering vegetables. But I, I bought some ginger, and he rings it up, and he says, what do you do with that? And I'm like, <laughs> you are in this business, um, and that is pretty interesting that you don't know that. And we have a question <laughs> from Irene Sobolov, and she's asking, what are the boundaries of the historic district? You can chime in or we can chime uh, in together? Well, yeah. What, what, why don't we make this an ensemble effort here? Okay. Washington Street is the primary historic district Correct. for Hoboken. Coming along with that is certain parts of Hudson Street, certain parts of Castle Point Terrace, or the entirety of Castle Point Terrace, I guess. I think the entirety. And then uh, the terminal area. Terminal which area. Is bounded by the, 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 the water, the terminal, uh, wearing square um, so it goes down Hudson Place and turns on to Hudson Street right and, and it's easy to miss Court Street in that uh, analysis. right and, and Court Street is, is is bundled in there and there's talk now just so maybe people know maybe they're interested of recobbling redoing the cobbles or I forget what they there's another name for sets, this, no, sets. Uh, to make the street more even and more drivable, which I'm not sure is a really good idea because people go down that fast enough as it is, but um, it's certainly worth preserving. The, the Newark Street portion is actually a county road, so they're not, it's two different things, but. Interesting, I didn't know that. But uh, all, of, all of Washington Street, which means that a lot of what we see and do is storefronts and signage. And um, for now, that's it. There are sites, right? We have some some specific buildings around town that are correct, national or state register, right? Um, and these are all, you know, interesting, interesting buildings. Ch most of the churches are. I had heard um, that there was someone inquiring as to what could be built on the land that the whole Church of the Holy Innocents occupies, and I was pretty, pretty oh, shocked. Right. 
They were uh, lived in the. Uh, oh yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, she lived oh, in that building. Right. Oh wow. Second floor. Well, now it has more light, Taylor, <laughs> <laughs> and air. So the rent's going up. There you go. Yeah, I often wondered why that wasn't absorbed by the uh, the parking lot project, but yeah. who knows? I think he held out. That was his. That was his thing. Um, what else do you see in Hoboken? I mean, where do you, where do you see, you know, new people coming from? What do you, what do you believe the future of this town is? Well, it's a, th this is the parade studio on the way out. I oh. was driving past it every day as they basically tore it down, and this is one, one of the last days. So it's very close to my own heart. It's, it's emblematic of sort of what I'm here to talk about. Um, it, I can remember being very young, 17, 18, you know, when you're bar hopping and that sort right. of thing, and, and going into Manhattan and saying, you know, this just isn't fair. There's these crappy little three-story buildings, and there's some guy, 65 years old, walking his dog. And this is really some place an 18-year-old should be living right. and staying out all night and, and walking home. And um, such is Hoboken now. And obviously, you're on the other side of the equation. In Manhattan, you, you go up town, and that's where all the high-rises are, and you don't realize that lower Manhattan was developed much earlier and once the area became more and more popular, the high-rises came into play and they were in the outlying areas. That, I think, is the best possible future for Hoboken. Back in the president streets, as we call them, for better or for worse, there's really not much left of the historical factories that were back there, manufacturing warehouses, that sort of thing. They were all fallow, vacant lots for my early tenure here. So there wasn't much to save there, even though I did like that white diamond sign at uh, 7th and, uh, what was that, Monroe. That was pretty cool. Um, but I think the town should have a historic district. <laughs> I don't think you should be allowed to take down a building in the middle of Bloomfield Street uh, and create a modern structure there amongst a bunch of Victorians. I think it's out of place. I think there's other places you can build that structure. If that's your intent, go to the west side of town, do something over there. So I think uh, Hoboken needs to take stock of itself and get out in front of the trending of what's going on now, which is, you know, large budgets coming in and buildings coming down. Well, uh, in my neighborhood, which is when you look at it and think about it, it's the industrial section. It sort of extends from where the new Wonder Lofts are, where the where Wonder Bread was, and they, they did, I think, a, a pretty good adaptive reuse of that. And you go south, and you come to, like, Third and Grand, and you have the K&E building on the Grand Street side, and you also have K&E on the Adams Street side. And then there's a, a large red warehouse structure between Third and mid block south which wraps actually around from grand to adams that's an old like 19th century thing and then the building i live in across the street is an old factory building and then behind us is an even older building that i understand was a silk mill in the 1850s so that is for my mind pretty much what's left of historic industrial hoboken and, and this whole end of town actually if you go down the block the building is so been worked over, it's unrecognizable, it was a milk, some sort of dairy facility that someone's turned into a rather deluxe uh, living space. Um, there used to be coat factories, one-story coat factories on Grand. But there's still, that, that little nugget is sort of the industrial history. There were foundries on Grand and Adams down in that neighborhood. So, it, you know, I think those are so well occupied that they would be impossible to sort of buy and unwind into something else. So right. that, you know, through through a process that we sort of, in some ways, uh, you know, cast aspersions at, have actually saved it. Right. So. Um, no, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And that, that's a good example of, uh, you know, the evolution of an urban area. At, at the same time, by your same token, I've looked at, say, Court Street, and all you would need is the right wealthy homeowner or developer to buy three 
consecutive buildings on Court Street and knock them down and put something completely inappropriate there to destroy the character of Court Street. And right, right now, there is very little legal recourse those residents would have should something like that start to happen. Well, I think some m many of those buildings are attached to either properties on Washington or Hudson. So it's not a, exactly a freestanding property. And I think lot coverage and things have kept that right at bay for now. But, you know, right. people well, are always pressuring and trying well, to change Well, okay. Change it out. What are we, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the same conversation to Willow Muse then. Right. That has been sort of done in so many ways to Sunday. It's, I don't know what... <laughs> what's happening over there anymore every time i go by i'm surprised yeah it, it's it, interesting it really is the museum of extensions isn't it right what other things what other plans do you have what are you what are you looking at these days what do you do for pleasure what is your oh uh, boy uh you, you know the thing about hoboken for the first 30 40 years i lived here is in the summer everyone leaves Okay. So you can park in front of your building, and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking right. about. And so I, I did a lot of that, uh, and I said, this is great. <laughs> I have to tell myself all summer. Right. Well, uh, I, I got a little bee in my bonnet about five, six years ago, and I said, you know what? It'd be nice to maybe think about having a cabin in the woods. And so before real estate took over, I my, my key to success is to buy pieces of real estate in really terrible condition and improve them on the 10-year plan. And uh, as such, I found such a property in Bushkill, Pennsylvania, and that's where I spend my weekends primarily now mm -hmm. with my wife and uh, my, my son goes to college near there and our, our family dog, Daisy. And uh, I just really enjoy that now. And I never thought I would. You know, I always had a uh, I always thought I was a city boy, and I, I do like it here, and I don't think I would ever want to leave Hoboken altogether. But the older I get, the more I'm just like, uh, I, I just want to kick back on the weekend. I've had, I've had enough city for this week, and I didn't used to be that way. So maybe, maybe that's trending. Yeah. No, I, I, we have friends in that position ourselves. I, 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 you know, I love Hoboken. It's a great place. Um, I am a city person, and I... I I remember when I went to college, I'd been living in New York City before that, and it was so quiet, I was frightened. And I traded rooms with the guy. He was on the parking lot. We were walking down the hallway, and he was complaining about his noisy room, and I was complaining about my quiet room, and we just swapped. <laughs> and I slept like a baby. There were cars honking, kids, you know, they were doing whatever they're doing in the parking lot. And I was great. And they looked at me like I was crazy. They couldn't understand that at all. But I think Hoboken answers a lot of those questions. We live around the corner from the hospital. I mean, they moved the emergency room over to 4th Street, which is somewhat of a blessing. You know, and some guy built on the property next to us. We had to wall up some windows, so that cut out some noise. So it, we've, it's sort of mellowed with us. We're yeah. sort of good in that respect. That is good. What's that? So tell us about this guy. This okay, uh, well, back to my uh, wandering musings of uh, different places in Hoboken. This is in a stairwell. This is why we end wow. up there. The best historic real estate in Hoboken, or a very significant, considerable chunk of it, is frat houses. And uh, hmm. a, a, as such, not, not a tremendous number of stair repair guys around. So we, we hit just about every block in town at one point or another. This is in a frat house on uh, Castle Point Terrace. Actually, that's just in a stairwell. And I'm sure if you pan down, there'd be six beer cans on the floor. This is just a detail of that stained glass. It's just, I'm trying to point out what amazing work it is. And it's, it's just sitting there. And, and it survived so, a frat house. Right, and, and the world has just passed by, and yeah. it stayed there, and uh, that's one thing about frat houses, that they really don't improve them. They right. just fix things that are broken, so right. as such, they stay intact. But one would think a chair would have flown through there by now. This, I, I just brought this in as, for contrast. I, I thought the wainscoting was amazing. You can see the window shutters. If you, uh, if you know from townhouse, those clothes, they, they mm -hmm. fold into the wall, and in the clothes business, position they they cover the window entirely the mantle and the overmantle here are just phenomenal <laughs> and this is all being complemented or played off 
the world's most downscale drop ceiling right. from from a, I don't we, know, a church basement uh, basketball room or something. Which you barely it. notice because all this is so stunning. Right. And the floor is beautiful, too. Right. No. It's a beautiful band, decorative band. Right. You have face nail, inlaid, white oak. I think that's, that's that's one of the things about Hoboken. I mean, it was all built in a relatively short span of time, like from the late 1800s to the early 19, 19th century, 20th century, rather, like to the 30s. And there was money, there were craftspeople, and people just went to town. Or not. Okay, well, th th this is me <laughs> after. What you're seeing here, this is, uh, I think it's on Will Avenue. This is the basement of a building, and what you're looking at there, the, the four dots, those are speaking tubes in the basement adjacent to the dumbwaiter shaft. And basically, someone is calling into each of those in turn to tell someone to bring their ice upstairs. Wow. Or, or the like. Okay. And it, it's still intact. It's still sitting there. And uh, obviously, uh, fire code has them welding these dumbwaiter shafts closed, so fires don't mitigate through the building, but... I thought it was interesting. Doesn't need batteries. Yeah. <laughs> Always works in a, in a, in That's a right. power outage. Yeah. And this is the speaking tube upstairs. This is where, this is up on the third floor where you hear somebody down in the basement saying, you know, go over to the dumbwaiter shaft or whatever. And I thought this building in particular was interesting because of this. That's a texture on the wall right. that's been done by hand. That is not a wallpaper. And this building is uh, basically an hour before the wrecking ball here so none of this really exists anymore but uh i mean one would think that someone would try and salvage the moldings and stuff i mean this is oh, is this like walnut uh i i can tell you here it's darkened this has probably been shellacked 50 times yeah, right, right. which means this has been kept after and it is heartbreaking how many times i am brought into a home a townhouse and i'm like wow this has been in the same family for 80 years, and you have a door that's eight foot high that's never been painted. It's natural wood, and I'll, I'll remark on that, and the designer will say, yeah, this is all going. We're, we're doing open floor plan here. <laughs> but, but even, I mean, if, if they're not going to use it, it's still salvageable. I mean, these things can be used in other homes, and I'm sure a lot of people do that because there are places that specialize in this. But like that, that fireplace, I don't know if that was slated for the wrecking ball, but that whole right. mantle system, I mean, where are you going to find one of those? So, you're not. Yeah. You're not. And I can tell you, this this is a beer can we found. This is somebody sneaking a beer on the job in, uh, uh, I don't know. This was 1941. On Hudson, yeah. Whatever. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Somebody in there doing a stair repair without, without the high standards that we have. They were drinking on the job and uh, thought it was cool. This is on Willow Avenue. This sign exists to this day. I, uh, where is it? It's, Flamboyant, I forget what it is now. Become one of those. Tenth in Willow? Oh, the restaurant? Pizza, pizza place. Is it a pizza place now? It's uh, hard to say. Anyway, there it says, no, no beggars or peddlers allowed. That sign is still on the door to this day. I, I thought it was fascinating. Unreal. This, I, I put on Facebook. I, I do this occasional thing on Facebook. I call it Vanishing Hoboken, which is... <laughs> derivative of vanishing New York, which no longer exists, by the way. The, the man who was doing that just said, there's just not enough. It's all gone. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's all gone. <laughs> this, there was a rather hot debate about this more than once. I think it's a bullet hole. This is uh, seven or 800, 900 block of Willow Avenue. And I saw that and I said, that's a perfectly round hole and it's been taped a hundred times. I think it's a bullet hole. And how, how, many, how many times do you have to paint something for it to look like that? I, I would ask you. But, uh, I don't know. Make up your own mind. I think it's a perfectly round hole. BB or pellet? If there was anything else, it would shatter. Could be. Zip gun. Could be. It was rough times up on Willow. Anything else you want to touch on in Hoboken uh, here? I mean, we, we're yeah. almost out of time. I think we've done really well. But I yeah. think that... Um, I, I think, honestly, I think I, this has worked out um, pretty well. It, it, we've surveyed everything I set out to mention. Uh, we, we've exhausted my pictures, which I thought I brought about eight times what I should have. And uh, 
I managed to extrapolate on all of them anyway. And uh, I, I, I think I've covered it, Steve. Well, I, I want to thank you for being the busiest man in Hoboken. I want to thank you for sharing this. And, and just, you know, I think what I'm taking away from this is that there's a lot of public service here. There's a lot of involvement. Not everybody has to, you know, go to these lengths. And I think you've, you've gone to some great lengths. But I think it's, it's good to be involved in your neighborhood. It's good to meet people. It's good to help a city move forward. And, and you know, there's debate. Not everybody wants to go in the same direction. But you need people in there who are willing to, you know, take up the challenge and look at the issues, sort of pick them apart and come up with, some sort of consensus so that people can move forward in a sort of civilized way. Well, absolutely right. And I, I'll tell you this, uh, Jonathan Metch just weighed in, oh. another person from our Preservation Commission. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you know, when, when you're young, you see these older people doing these things. And I got involved with the Historic Preservation Commission years ago, and I thought it was interesting. It was a hoot because in, in what I do, you can open up a stair and you're looking at a pile of shavings wood shavings that just fell there 150 years yeah, ago i mean there's such an immediate yeah. connection yeah. that happens there and with something like historic preservation you get into these case studies and happily we haven't gotten in any in particular but you begin to realize if someone like me doesn't do this it's all going to disappear right. <laughs> And, and you get to be as old as I am, and you say, I'm that guy now. <laughs> you never, I don't, I don't know, I never set out to be that guy, right. but you realize if I don't do it, I don't know who's going to do it. Like right? right. the stair building, it's, that, that becomes your role, I think, as you progress through the system. And uh, I try to be community-minded. And uh, Thaler has come in, we both worked and are working to balance the economic benefits of historic preservation with the economic contributions of modern development. Thank you for your efforts. Well, thank you, Thaler. Thank you. Thanks for, for being on the commission as well. She's one of our commissioners. So I want to thank you and I want to thank the Hoboken Historic Museum for, for, for hosting this and Ren Hoppy for our engineering. Yes, thank you, Rand. And Bob Foster for for his stewardship of this institution, which has been a, a long-running successful project that I hope continues. If, and I think you and Bob can sit down, have a beer, and the, the conversation can be titled, well, if we don't do it, who will? Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> there, I don't know who's no, taking your places. No, I remember being in here doing a little this and that when they were first taking over the space. He, Excellent. He's done an amazing thing here. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. All good. My pleasure. And again, thank you, Rand. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Thanks, guys. I'm gonna take over and, and do some uh, thanks here at the, at the, uh, the end of the show. So uh, hopefully this will, this will work out. Oh, hang on. There we, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Um, so thanks, Steve Zane and Marty Anderson for another great episode of uh, Hoboken Talks. We've got Coach Ed Stinson coming up with uh, Stu Chirichella. Um, should be a great show. Check the calendars. We've got we're still booking people um, for for our later shows. Hoboken Talks is now twice a month. I think it's the second and fourth uh, Thursdays, and uh, so just keep your eyes on that. Go to our YouTube channel and and uh, subscribe and take the notifications, so you see when we're scheduling our our, our new um, our new talks. Uh, we'd like to thank the New Jersey Historical Commission. They are a major supporter of the museum and, and help us uh, with many, many uh, uh, financial uh, support, uh, general operational support. New Jersey Council hum for the Humanities has helped sponsor our new uh, our, our exhibit that's down uh, here in the museum, the, the fires. Um, it's a wonderful uh, exploration of, of a really tough time in Hoboken and I urge you to come by and, and, and visit and take it in. It was guest curated by Chris Lopez. Uh, wonderful photographs, oral histories, and more. Uh, we'd like to thank our shipyard circle, our, our donors at the at a highest level. We have a, a number of uh, trustees on the shipyard circle and, and a whole bunch of other wonderful people. We love uh, all of our donors, our members, our volunteers. Thank you so much for your support. 
Uh, we'd like to thank Iron State. Iron State, we thank Iron State every day. They are, uh, provide us with our space here in the, uh, the, the shipyard uh, at 1301 Hudson, and uh, they, they, they help us in, in many other ways in fundraising efforts. Um, so that, yeah, there's our, there's our fires exhibit. Um, again, please come by and, and check it out. Check out the web page as well. Um, there's some, we've included some of the uh, information and, and content from the exhibit on our other fires uh, website. This Sunday, uh, I'm going to be talking with Mark Singleton. Uh, Mark grew up in town and was the board president of the Hoboken Shelter for, for many years. I've also been a, a shelter board member for uh, uh, quite some time, and we're going to talk about the fires and the found, founding of the shelter. Um, there'll be some video clips and uh, just some uh, reminiscences about what was going on in Hoboken at that time. Uh, and then uh, April 16th, we'll have Yomira C. Uh, Figueroa Vasquez. She's a Hoboken-born um, writer, scholar, and associate professor of Afro-Diaspora Studies at Michigan State University. She consulted on the exhibit. She wrote a wonderful uh, introductory essay uh, that's, that's here uh, on the wall and on the web page. Um, right, we've got a few more days left with the uh, Upper gallery. We feature Hoboken-themed um, artwork in the in the gallery. This particular uh, artist uh, is a poet and provide uh, provides poems on a typewriter. And some some of you may have seen Pierce Logan um, over by the Walgreens on um, First and Washington. And this exhibit, his exhibit, will will go through this Sunday. And then um, we welcome, a uh, week after that, on April 8th, we welcome Patrick Neal with some um, watercolor paintings of the marina. Uh, we will have an um, artist interview with, with uh, Patrick a week from tonight on April 6th. So check that out. Again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll say it again. And uh, so there we are. Yes, I, uh, for the third time, I'll, ju I'll just acknowledge that, that you know, we like comments and likes and share our videos with your friends. That is it. It's the Hoboken Historical Museum, Hoboken Talks, Thursday nights at 7. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, all of our members and volunteers and donors. Uh, Rand Hoppy, signing up. <laughs>